In this lesson, I'm going to talk about leadership. And your first reaction to hearing that may be like, well, what does leadership have to do with emotional healing? And what does, it, what does it have to do with co-counseling? And it actually has a tremendous amount to do with healing. And I'm going to make my case in various ways over the course of this video. But what I'll say first just now is that being in the counseling role is a kind of leadership. So our relationship to the whole notion of leadership is going to affect how comfortable we can be and what kind of job we can do while we're in the counseling role. But it's important for a bunch of different reasons. So what I want to say first is that there's a, there's a societal notion that the world is kind of divided up into leaders and followers. And I want us to reject that notion right from the beginning. Everybody is a leader and everybody is a follower, depending on the context. And there are areas in which you have a tremendous amount to give. There are areas where you have not just skills and abilities, but areas where you have important thoughts and insights, where the world would benefit from your leadership. And there are areas where any of us will not be particularly strong and we wouldn't want to be in the leadership role. And where we are in a sense followers, although I want us to rethink what it means to be a follower, I don't even think that's the right term because someone who's working with a leader, everybody else who's working with the leader shouldn't be followers. They should be accepting guide, people who are accepting guidance, but who are also continuing to not just be led wherever the leader takes them if things start to really not make sense to them. So there are ways that we need to be more active and thoughtful and leader-like even when we're, we're not playing a leadership role. Now, the models of leadership in the modern world are mostly bad. There are some good models, but they're mostly bad. And one of the results of that is that we just start to have negative associations with the whole notion of leadership. And we start to think, oh, we don't like leaders. I wouldn't want to be a leader. Because in the modern world, leadership tends to be equated with dictating. A leader is someone who tells people what to do. And in all modern countries, all modern nations, people have very little say over what happens in their country. And if, if your country is structured as a so-called democracy or whether your country is structured as a dictatorship, the truth is that, that you and I, sort of ordinary folks of ordinary means, have very little influence over what happens in the key decisions that affect the quality of our lives, the quality of our work and our workplaces, the quality of our environment, the health of our globe, and so forth. So the leaders are making the decisions for us. They are bossing us around. Our work bosses, our governmental bosses, our corporate bosses, the people who are, who are really deciding what happens in the country are just a very small group of people, and the rest of us have to live with what they decide. The rest of us don't have say. So those kinds of ways of thinking about leadership then get spread through the whole society. A lot of us grew up in homes where leadership was essentially tyranny. And so that's how, that's how we come to think about leadership. So I, I want to redefine what it means to be a leader. A leader is not the boss. A leader is not someone who tells people what to do and takes, takes their decision-making power away from them. A leader is someone who helps the group figure out what's best for them, what they're after, and helps them get what they want. So leadership skills are coordination. They are helping people communicate more effectively with each other, helping them hear each other better, helping a group clarify what it's after, helping a group come up with strategies and plans for how it's going to get to, to where it gets. And yes, a leader does make some decisions. But a leader generally is making the smaller day-to-day -day decisions that the whole group doesn't need to be encumbered with. Where it's helpful to just say, well, these little are things you just decide. But even then, even with respect to the smaller decisions, the leader should be accountable to the whole group. In other words, periodically, the group should reflect some on, well, how well is our leader doing it, these smaller decisions that we're just letting him or her make. And so even, even with the decisions that the leader just does, there's still ultimately an accountability to the group about whether, whether that's being done well and whether that's being done in ways that the group likes and that serve group interests. Now, I'll just say as a sidelight here, there are certain contexts 
where a group leader really does just get to make the decisions. But those are, those are a smaller number of contexts where, for certain reasons, we've clearly decided as a group, as a community, that that's how we think it should be. I would say, for example, the coach of a soccer team, just to pick a random example, uh, he or she gets to decide how things are going to be done because that's how we agree a soccer coach should function. But even then, the coach should have some considerable flexibility, should be listening to the player's opinions, should be listening to parents' opinions, and really taking those seriously and incorporating them, should not be leading from some kind of rigid, no, I'm the boss, don't, don't tell me what to do, I, I, I do what I decide to do, kind of mentality. That's, that's lousy leadership, even in those specific contexts where we're agreeing, yes, this person does just get to decide for, for everybody. In most contexts, that's not appropriate anyhow. In most contexts, leadership should look much more like what I just described. In our workplaces, everywhere, I mean, our workplaces, our schools, our communities, everywhere, people should not have the right to just decide for us and the rest of us lose our say over things. So, uh, so you have leadership skills and you have insights that the world needs, you have abilities that the world needs. And so, so I'm encouraging you to think of yourself as a leader, even if you haven't thought of yourself in that way in the past, to start aiming yourself more and more in that direction, and to think about where in your life you want to lead and where in your life you don't want to lead. Pick one or two or three areas where you think, I I've got really some important things to offer here. This is where I should lead in my life. And in the other areas of life, I'll, I'll let other people do the leading. That's that's completely appropriate. That's how we we want to do things. That's how, that's how it's going to work. But I want to emphasize a couple of points. One is that taking more leadership supports your own healing. It supports how you view yourself. It supports your sense of hopefulness about your life. It supports your sense of hopefulness about the world, which in turn will help you have good sessions. And then having good sessions will in turn help you feel more hopeful about life and the world. That's one of those positive feedback loops that we can get going. Bringing, if you come into your session with some hopefulness, you're much more likely to be able to process some deep emotions. You're much more likely to get to have some experiences of discharge. And then that in turn will help you go out and, and kick the, world, the world's butt and, and really make things happen and, and get things moving. So, it's, it's important to your own well-being to, to lean into leadership and develop your leadership, and the world needs it. We're at a point in history where we're living in urgent times. We need the best that everybody has to give. We need way more good leadership of all of our organizations, whether they're activist organizations or communitarian organizations or, or helping organizations. It, all of our organizations need better leadership. And the, our managers at work are generally not, again, good models of leadership. They're either dictatorial or they're at the other end of the spectrum. They're being too passive. They're not addressing issues that need to be addressed. The, at the same time that at our workplaces, we tend to be really frustrated about the way that bosses are just coming down on people who totally don't deserve it, or they're coming down on people for standing up for the workers, which is totally wrong. But then at the same time, they'll be failing to deal with issues, for example, of workers who absolutely aren't doing their jobs, which is frustrating all the other workers. So on every front, we need better, better leadership. And so it benefits you, it benefits your community, it benefits your wider world, your people, however you choose to define who your people are. When, when you lean into leadership, when you develop those abilities in yourself, when you start to see yourself as a leader, and you start to look at where do you want to lead. And, and one of the questions that arises is, well, how, how do I figure out where I want to lead? And, and that's a complicated question. I think there's a lot to it. It's, it's a question to take to your co-counseling sessions to be exploring, like, where, where do I really want to go? Where do I want to lead? A couple of particular questions that I would encourage you to go into one is just what do you love the most? Where, where does your passion lie? It's likely that 
your your leadership is going to be most valuable in areas that you love and and where, where your heart lies where there's this just natural motivation in you natural desire to have that be a big part of your life uh, another question that i would ask you to spend some time exploring and this one may be challenging is what do i have that the world needs and, and, and a question within that question, how, what do I know that the world needs to understand? In other words, what do I understand that the world needs to understand? Because you've got really important thoughts and you've got really important insights. Everybody does. Everybody does. And we're not generally finding enough places in our lives where our insights will be accepted and valued and used. And a lot of times we're not sharing our insights because we don't know what they are or we're just expecting them to be shot down. And a lot of times we have childhood experiences where our thinking just wasn't valued. And, and this is painful for kids. And people don't realize how smart kids are. They don't realize how much kids have to offer. I mean, a four-year-old can tell you better ways to do things if you're listening. If you're listening in a household, you know, one of your really young kid in the household will say, why are we doing this this way? Why aren't we doing this the other way? And most people don't take that seriously. They, they don't listen. And if you're listening, a lot of time you realize, oh, yeah, you're right. Thank you. That really makes sense. We'll do it the way you're suggesting. That would be a much better way to do it. And if we grew up with those kinds of experiences, then we would enter the adult world with this attitude of, that we should have some influence because we should all have influence on, on how things are done. Now, Talking about that same image that I just gave you of the family from the parenting side. If you have raised children or are currently raising children, you have developed lots of leadership skills. You have developed so many of the skills that any leader needs to have of the time, the, the, the ability to be decisive when it's time to be decisive, the ability to take other people's opinions into account, but then you make the decision when it's time to make the decision. The, and a family can't entirely be a democracy. Children's opinions should carry much more weight than they do in the modern world, but the, the adults still have to make the ultimate decisions. That, that, that makes sense in a family. If you've raised children, you've done a lot of listening, if you've done it even remotely well. You've done a lot of coordinating, like how am I going to meet this person's needs and this person's needs and this person's needs at the same time, or how are we going to arrange so that everybody's meeting everybody's needs? Well, that's so much of what a leader is doing, is thinking about how can we get everybody's needs met in this group. Not how can I meet them all, but how can we as a group figure out how to meet everybody's needs. If, if, you, if you're raising children or you've raised children, you've done a bunch of planning. And planning, as I'm going to say in a couple of minutes, is such a key skill that a leader has. So many different aspects of things. So... If, you, if, if you've had children, don't tell me, oh, well, I'm just not a leader or I just don't have leadership skills because it, it's, just, it's just not so if you've, if you've raised kids. So I'm going to talk about certain specific uh, skills that, that I think are really important to good leadership and that I believe we should all be working on, on developing them more, strengthening our abilities in these areas, a lot of these are, th are emotional things, internal things that we can be working on in our sessions to develop our leadership skills. So what are, what are some key things that we need to be developing? One is simply believing that your thoughts and opinions matter. That, that's essential to being a leader is that you have to believe you have really important things to contribute and that people would be benefiting from taking in your thoughts, from, from, from using what, what you have to say. In other words, we have to believe that our influence would be valuable, and we have to be looking for ways to increase our influence. And that means that we also have to be developing confidence. You have to be seeing how you can become more self-assured over time, less timid, less self-doubting, less self-deprecating. In other words, trying to quiet those messages in your head that say you're not that smart or you should listen to other people because they're much smarter. You should never be deferring to someone else because you think they're smarter. You could defer to someone else because what they said makes more sense, spe the specific thing they said. But you should never defer to them just because in some general sense, oh, well, that's a smarter person. It's like the, I, I don't completely believe in the notion of smarter people and less smart people. But even, but, but even if you do believe in that, even if it's a really smart person, that doesn't mean they're right this time. 
you, there's a good chance that you're the one that's right this time. So hold on to your thinking unless the other person comes to make more sense. And you start to think, okay, yeah, that, that really, what they're saying really does make more sense, but not because of who they are. Don't defer them because of who they are. Next, a leader needs to be able to lead with some confidence and decisiveness, but without defensiveness. And that's, that's a skill that can take some time to develop to be able to hear other people's opinions, to be able to incorporate other people's opinions, to not get into kind of an ego place of like, well, no, I'm the boss, I decide here, this is how we do things here, whether they make sense or not, we're gonna do it this way. And and even if it's totally not working for you, you still need to do it our way and so forth. To, to stay out of that kind of thinking and be able to be flexible. And that's that's a mix, that mix of firmness and flexibility the way we want our strong muscles to be in our bodies, right? We want them to be really firm, but also flexible. Uh, that's an ability that, that can, can take some work to, to grow and, and get more skillful at, but you can do it. And, and it's, it's such a pleasure to be in the presence of a leader who can be firm and flexible at the same time. So that's what, that's what we want to reach for. Uh, you need to be able to ask for help. You need to have a sense of when to ask for help, uh, you need to work through any messages in your head that say, oh, I shouldn't need help. Why, I should be able to handle this myself. Developing confidence is not the same thing as deciding that you can handle everything by yourself. That's a mistake. It's unhealthy. The whole Lone Ranger mentality is the kind of thing we want to get away from. We want to get away from the notion of a hero, although in so many ways we're all heroes. That's a, that's a whole other topic. But we want to get away from that kind of mindset. And whoever told you, oh, well, you, sh you shouldn't need help with this, don't listen to that. It, it's human, it's so deep in human nature, so deep in human history, in hundreds of thousands of years of human history, to need help and to function much better when we're getting proper help. Human beings function much better when our minds are working in conjunction with other minds, when our bodies are working in conjunction with other bodies. We're inherently, deeply, profoundly social animals, and that's how most of us therefore function the best. So practice asking for help, get over the, the, the blocks or any shame you have around asking for help. And that means help with actual tasks, but it also means help thinking about what needs to be done. And it also just means help with what you're dealing with emotionally while, while you're being a leader. Keep building your base of support. And what, what, both in the co-counseling world, within, you know, within the Peak Living Network and beyond, to just have more people in your life that are supportive, that you have really positive, close, meaningful interactions with. Any leader needs to be constantly tuning up and expanding their, their, their support network. And so many leaders in our world are really isolated. And that's not only not good for them, it's really bad for their leadership. The quality of their leadership deteriorates in multiple ways over time because of because they're working alone and because they're not they don't have enough that they're leaning into a leader needs to develop planning skills i made reference to that with respect to parents so the ability to think ahead the ability to anticipate obstacles and start thinking early about how those obstacles are going to be addressed and it means a lot of different ranges from thinking about okay we're having a meeting tonight what's the agenda going to be for the meeting and how are we going to get this meeting to go well and how are we going to keep so and so from talking over everybody else the way he or she has done in the past and you know, all those kinds of challenges that we have in groups and organizations and neighborhoods, whatever that we belong to. So that kind of micro planning, what are we going to do today up to like, how's this week going to work and how are the next 10 years going to work? And, and being the one who's taking that kind of long-term view, that's a, that's a key leadership skill, a key leadership contribution. Co-counseling skills are really valuable to, to leading. And particularly if you're going to lead within the Peak Living Network, for example, if you want to run support groups in the Peak Living Network, it's really going to be helpful to you to take a co-counseling training or a couple of co-counseling trainings. But it'll also just help you on other fronts in life. The, the co-counseling training just in general helps with how well you listen to people, with how well you're able to separate out sort of good thinking from woundedness, and it, it, it just helps us become more effective on, on various fronts in our lives. So if, if you're participating in co-counseling training now, you're already working towards developing some really valuable skills towards your leadership. 
uh, you need to lead with decisiveness and you need to get enough rest. Leaders chronically, particularly, sadly, as they get more effective, often start to then really harm themselves by not getting enough rest. And over time, again, that will also harm the quality of their leadership. When you get panicked about a situation, when you're in pain about a situation, for example, you see how much people are suffering and you start to have some success at doing something about that suffering, or you're in a panic about global warming and you start to build an organization that is successfully having some impact on policies and behaviors, it's very easy then to fall into thinking, I can't ever stop. I, I better not stop because this work is too important because I can't let people suffer. And those internal motivations are really positive. It's great that you care so much about the world. It's great that you're so eager to relieve human suffering. That's a wonderful thing. But don't let that stop you from resting. You're In the long term, you're going to be much more valuable to the world. I'm serious. You're going to be much more valuable to the world in the long term if right now you do somewhat less and make sure that you're getting proper rest. And we have to work against patterns that we can carry of compulsiveness, of feeling like I have to do this, no one else is going to do it. If I don't do it, nobody will. I'm the only one. That kind of, you know, the hero mentality that I was talking about that leads to compulsiveness and it leads to getting too controlling over other people. And then you're going to become subtly or overtly dictatorial and you're going to not be getting enough rest. So some specific things about leading within the Peak Living Network. And I hope you folks will be thinking about starting your own support groups and even trying to create a whole support network around yourself where you live. One is you do need to get comfortable in certain situations simply being the decision maker. And I talked earlier about how there are contexts where that is actually appropriate. And one of the places where that is appropriate is when you're the one that started a support group and you're leading a support group. You get to make decisions when you decide this decision has to be made and I'm going to take this decision on. That's your right if you're the, if you're the creator and facilitator of that group. That's not an excuse to become dictatorial. You still need to really take other people's feelings and needs into account and develop flexibility, but it doesn't mean that you have to put things to, to a vote. In the, the, in, if you've started the group, it's okay for you to be the ultimate decision maker about what that group's going to be about, about who's going to be in the group, and about how the group is going to run. If you get real bossy about things, you're going to lose people and your group isn't going to work. So I'm not, I'm not, that's not what I'm advocating. But I'm advocating you having a sense of, like, I, I get to decide this. Like, that, this, that's okay right now if I just make this decision. Uh, work to overcome the, the need or the sense of obligation to solve people's problems for them. In the Peak Living Network, we have a commitment to not giving advice, not doing problem-solving work with people. You know, I talk about don't even say, have you tried this, have you tried this, have you tried this? And we make one exception to that, which is in a group, in a Peak Living Network the group that's specifically about setting and meeting goals. In that context, we allow advice giving and problem-solving. But everywhere else in the Peak Living Network, people are not supposed to be giving advice or even going into problem-solving mode with you. And so when you're the leader, you're not even supposed to be solving people's problems. So let go of, the, of, the, of your need to do that or your sense of obligation to do that. And that means when, when you're leading a support group and people are taking their turns, don't feel like you need to pull people out of bad places emotionally that they may be in. It, it won't work well. And it'll, it'll end up being too much of a burden to you. So it will neither help the person nor be good for you. It's very hard when someone is saying, oh, I'm just so discouraged today. I'm just feeling like nothing's ever going to get better. As the group leader, you feel this very strong pull to, I, you know, I've got to make this person feel like there's hope. I've got to make them feel like tomorrow's going to be better. I feel it too. So I totally sympathize with this. But we need to not act on it. The, the group leader's role and the role of everybody in the group is say, wow, that's really hard. You're in a really discouraged place today. It must be hard to be that downhearted. It must be really hard to be feeling like nothing's going to get better. Tell us more about that. What's that like for you? What does it feel like things aren't? To, 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 what's it like to feel like things aren't going to get better? Uh, how, how did you get here? You know, when was the last time you were feeling better than this? And what, what, how did you come down? You know, just learn to just be learning, exploring with the person what's going on for them. That's our job. Our job isn't to cheer them up. So fight against that urge. And similarly, fight against the urge to make kind of summarizing comments, like putting a cap on it, putting icing on the cake 
at the end of the person's turn. There, there's again a sort of feeling with a, when you're in leadership where it's hard to just let the person's turn end and, and say, okay, now it's time to go to the next person's turn. The beeper went off, your time is up, we need to go to the next person. Because that's how we do it in Peak Living Network, right? Turns are timed, then you go to the next person. And you can see my video on starting and running Peak Living Network groups where I talk about the, the, the nuts and bolts of how our groups run. That's how we do it. So I feel it too. I feel it too, that temptation at the end of somebody's turn to, to kind of want to put, put, a, put, a, put a ribbon around it before we move on to the next person. Like somehow that's going to make the person feel better. And there's an awkward moment there when their turn ends. And we, as the leader, we need to take a couple deep breaths and just let that awkwardness be there and then move on to the next person. That's going to make you more of a help, not less of a help, to the person whose turn just ended. The, the summarizing habit is, is, a, is, a, is really a habit we want to break. It's not, it's not helpful. It's, it's not helpful. So avoid saying, wow, you know, thanks so much for what you've shared. Or, yeah, even that, I would prefer that you not say, thanks so much for what you've shared. The, they, they weren't sharing that for your benefit. They were sharing it for their own benefit. So we don't need to thank them for sharing those things. All we need to say is, I hear you, really glad you're here, we care about you, we care about what you're going through, now it's the next person's turn. So, so we don't have to say, oh, you know, wow, what, what, what triumphs you've had lately? No, nothing, nothing. Say, make comments like that during their turn. <laughs> but at the end of their turn, don't, don't try to sum it up. The, the biggest skill... Or, or the, I shouldn't say the biggest skill, the biggest challenge, the hardest skill I find in running a support group in the Peak Living Network, and this may be true of running support groups in general, is stopping people when their time is up. And that's, I think, in some ways the most uncomfortable challenge for the leader. A lot of your group members are just going to respect the time. When, when there's two minutes left or maybe three minutes left in somebody's turn, you give them a warning. We, we set a beeper. That's how we do things in groups and the people in the network. So the beeper goes off. They should hear it themselves, but then you're also going to remind them, okay, you got two minutes left or you got three minutes left, however you're doing the timing thing. And most people are going to respect that. They're going to use that time to start kind of winding themselves down so that when the, when the really final beeper goes off, they're ready to stop. But you're always going to have people in your group who don't do that. You're going to have people in your group who either don't really respect the, the beep, they're just feeling too, they're too lost in their own desperation, and they just feel like, I've got to talk some more, I've got to talk some more to try to relieve this desperation. I'm not saying that's conscious, it's often unconscious, but that's what's going on with them. Or there are people who just don't have a good sense of time, and so they feel like, oh, it'll just take me 20 seconds to finish this thought, and it takes them three minutes to finish that thought. And then they've taken way more than their share of the time. And it matters. It matters for the group when people run through the stop sign. It affects the whole group. It means either that other people's turns are going to get shorter, or it means that the group is going to run late, and that's going to affect people's lives. And there may be people who have to leave right on time, so they're going to miss the rest of the group if the group runs over. It means that people are doing more than their share of the listening, and that's okay one week or two weeks, but they're not going to be happy if that happens week after week, and you're going to start to lose enthusiasm for your group, you're going to start to lose attendance for your group. And so it's, it is day to day, one of the most important things you need to do as a leader is you need to stop people when their time is up. So what I recommend is that every week you remind people how important it is to stop when the beeper's up, that they can't just finish one more quick thought. It's like, no, you, the, the two-minute warning is to finish one more quick thought. The beeper is to stop. And, and I'll let see people, someone say a few more words to like literally finish their sentence, but that's it. But also have an agreement with your group that when you go like this, that means they have to stop. And because it may be hard to jump in in mid-sentence, although I encourage you to try to develop the ability to just jump right in in mid-sentence and say, you need to stop, sorry, that's time. But by also having an agreement with the group about, about going like this, then that way you don't have to say anything out loud. You don't have to interrupt them in mid-sentence, but you can, you know, like... So they know, like, and just have an agreement with your group. When I say that, like, you really have to stop, like, 10-word maximum <laughs> beyond the T sign for time. So, so that, that's, that's a skill that you'll probably need some support about and some encouragement about. Again, bring it to sessions about, oh, I don't feel comfortable telling people that they have to stop when they're talking about something that's really heavy. And, and, and we need to do that. Effective leadership in, that includes, like, even when someone's talking about something that's really intense, well, 
they knew the end of their term was coming and they opened up some really heavy subject, that's their responsibility. That's not the group's responsibility to just let that to let that happen. So to to just review a couple quick things. So you have important leadership skills. The world needs your leadership skills. You have really important things to offer. There are ways that you can explore so where you want to lead. There's also additional resources that we can share on the Peak Living Network, you know, good books, for example, on how to kind of get in touch with where your passion is and, and where you most want to be spending your time in life and, and including where in your life you want to be showing your leadership skills. Taking more leadership in the world is not just good for the world, it's good for you personally, and it will specifically affect your emotional healing process. It'll affect your ability to get go into emotions successfully and have them move through you rather than have them stay stuck. And that's so much of what co-counseling is all about, is how can we go into deep feelings and not just suffer in them, but actually have them move through us so that they get processed successfully, so that they get discharged through our discharge channels, and we can actually live free of the wounds that we've had in the past. 